Hello everybody, so uh, we're returning to World Historical World Chess Championship video series. I'm going to change the format, I'm going to do one game at a time. And we are back in the Steinitz vs. Zuckertort uh, World Championship match. Um, as mentioned previously, this match happened in three different cities in the US. First part was played in New York, which uh, was won by Zuckertort. And the second leg was played in St. Louis, and the third and final leg was played in New Orleans. Uh, this is the 12th uh, game. Um, after the disaster start by Steinitz, he was um, behind uh, in scoring only one point out of five games in New York. In St. Louis, he gained some ground back, but uh, he really started to play. Uh, well, and at this point he was leading by one point. So, uh, Sukertort plays black, and let's see what happens. Spanish game, Berlin, uh, 94, all looks pretty modern. Rookie 1 is one of the modern ways to play this position. D4 happened the famous Kramnik Kasparov match in the 2000s, right? But Rookie 1 is uh, actually more fashionable these days. Because white can just play for a small advantage and uh, without taking much risk. 95, bishop e7, another modern move. And now, of course, bishop f1 is the um, uh, modern way to play this position, and where black usually replies with knight f5, followed by c3, um, castling, or to be more accurate here, white plays knight f3 actually, and then d5, d4, castle, c3, and there are huge. Uh, a lot of uh, analysis and, more, and a lot of games played here. So we're not going to go into that. Um, let's see what happened in the real game. And White takes on c6. And uh, I think that uh, this move had more of a uh, psychological advantage as uh, Stein, Steinitz was trying to avoid preparation by his opponents as they have played this position already in the match before. And by playing uh, bishop c6, he wants to tra transpose the game into a neutral positional category. I would say that um, uh, he probably understood that uh, giving his opponent a pair of bishops was um, a risk. Uh, but uh, he probably he decided it was outweighed by the possibility that um, you know he was a, a point up in the match the, and he would uh, be able to you know defend his position slightly worse position. So let's see what happened. Pawn takes, very normal. You know, black uh, develops his light squared bishop. Queen e2 with a small trap. If uh, black goes uh, castling immediately, then of course white plays here and queen d8 and um, black is unable to use the white's weak back rank, right? Leaving quite with the solid extra pawn and uh, disastrous uh, structure for black. So bishop e6 was played, this is a good move. d3, although white uh, could have played d4 here immediately, but he decided to postpone it to be on the cautious side. And again, uh, it was a little trap by Steinitz because if black plays uh, castling, we see the same, uh, mot uh, same motive, right? If he takes with the bishop, then it's uh, queen e7. And again, black is unable to play rook e8 because of queen d8, leaving white with an extra pawn. Um, I'm having the engine here, a window, so you guys see how the modern grandmaster really analyzes the games. Um, he, you know, double checks with the engine, he uh, noticed some inaccuracies. If he sees a discrepancy between his evaluation and the engine evaluation, uh, then he tries, then he stops usually and tries to understand what's going on. Um, obviously, the engines are much stronger, and um, if it says something, uh, you know, which, uh, which uh, the grandmaster disagree, disagrees with, then uh, it has to be studied. The engine here that I'm using is Stockfish 8, which is uh, free. Stockfish is a free um, open source um, uh, program ran by fantastic guys. I've been using this engine for many years. There are many other free engines and commercial engines. Uh, and of course, Stockfish 8 is a little bit outdated. There recently, I think, Stockfish 11, which is latest free. And there are other versions. But and uh, other top players, of course, um, use uh, their own favorite, favorite engines. But Stockfish is mine. 
Okay, so knight f5 um, is a standard Berlin move. Knight on f5 is wonderfully placed. He takes control of a lot of squares. d4, e3, g3, right? He opens the d file for the heavy pieces. He protects the bishop on e7. So this is ideal square for knight in Berlin. Um, knight d2. Um, white tries to develop. You know, knight can go to e4, knight can go to f3, and black castles. Um, there, there was a possibility for black to play knight d4, uh, and then white probably has to play queen d1, because if he plays queen e4, hoping for this knight c2, knight c6 trick, uh, black uh, actually can do better by playing bishop f5 first, and then g5, and then he takes on c2, and is not scared of any tricks here, right? So this was a trick uh, move here by black knight d4. Uh, probably white would play queen d1 here, and then we would probably see the position which is basically very similar to the game. Um, white played uh, queen e2, returns to the game position after d4, c5. Uh, this would lead to a position where black would be very comfortable playing. He has spare bishops, open position. Uh, white knights have no strong outposts in the center. So black has uh, an advantage, but it's not so large because um, uh, white camp has no weaknesses really. So knight d4 was possible, but uh, there is nothing wrong with just castling and completing the development. So white plays c3, in a way we return to the line we just looked at. And rook e8, I think it's a great move. Rook belongs on the open files. The idea is for black to further play queen d5, rook a d8 followed by a 6, then bishop f8, and just, you know, uh, try to take control over the center and uh, open the diagonals for his bishops. So, knight e4, white uh, starts to do this cavalry thing, because, um, you know, if you just play normal chess, like knight f3, for example, right, then f6 already looks very uncomfortable, maybe bishop f8 first, and then this knight on e5 will have big problems going anywhere, as e5 can be met by f6, knight e3, for example, uh, queen d7 or bishop f7, and uh, knight on e3 is not that great. So Stanis realizes that, you know, this knight uh, should be going to e4, and uh, the other knight goes to d3 and c5. So, knight e4... Queen d5 was played immediately. It's not a bad move. Personally, I like moves like f6 and bishop f7, trying to put the bishops way behind, you know, from all possible attack. And then uh, just develop normally, like bishop f8, queen d7, um, and get those bishops away from white knights anywhere. Don't get anywhere near those knights, right? So this, this would be the modern, probably, approach by the uh, GMs. Uh, instead, black plays queen d5, there is nothing wrong with that move, it's quite okay. But now, black should have really played c5 here, and uh, making sure white's pawn stays on d3, because this way it is more weakness. Uh, white is unable to play d4 now, this pawn is also on the light square, potential target for the black's bishop, uh, right, e6 bishop. And also, this gives uh, black some room for the maneuvering and takes away some key squares from white's knights. So c5 was um, was a good idea. Instead, black plays rook a d8 and allows white to play d4 himself. Now, if black plays c5, he's just simply, you know, worse. And uh, at the most, he just gives up his pair of bishops. He plays knight d6. There are plenty of other moves, but knight d6, I think, is okay. You know immediately trying to get rid of white central knight on e4 also opening the f5 square for the bishop on e6 right and um, white plays knight c5 the computer says that white can play f3 inviting black to take on e4 which is impossible of course and simply trying to hold on to this knight but uh, i believe the stains would probably play knight c5 anyway um, trying First of all, getting that bishop on c8, looks kind of passive position, and then probably knight cd3. And after, yeah, right, so now, but, uh, but you know, bishop f8 and bishop c8 are pretty standard uh, positions for black in Berlin, especially if white goes for the main line with d4, d takes c5, like mentioned before in Kranich Kasparov games.
this part of Kramnik, sorry. Bishops there are quite um, well placed because they're standing far, they're shooting far, and they're waiting for the chance to hit some targets. And this position would be better for black. So, um, in the game happened knight c5, knight cd3, um, f6, uh, and knight b4. So, we mentioned before that bishop f8 was probably better. You know, avoiding all those potential tricks with knight on c6, you know, opening the e-file for the rook, but okay, f6 was played. Knight b4, and now black plays queen b5, although there is this queen e6 move, which was very interesting because it forces the exchange of the queens as well, but in a slightly different situation because um, now white cannot actually take this pawn on c6 because of this little trick, bishop f8, using white's rook on e2, unprotected status, right? So white cannot take on d8 because the rook takes e2, and if white moves this rook, for example, then black just plays rook d7, bishop d7, and while it looks like white has three pawns for a piece, for a minor piece, and it looks uh, mathematically like a good uh, compensation, in reality knight on a7 is stranded, and white wants to save him. For example, rook d8, rook a8 is one of the threats. Uh, white will have to damage his queen side structure, and especially in the positions where black has a pair of bishops in the end game, the pawns on the queen side are really going over. So, for example, if we play a4, knight f5, g5, for example, knight d6, knight takes away b5 square from white's knight, and also he takes control of the c4 square, and uh, knight b5, for example, bishop d5 just simply lost because bishop goes to c4. Um, and if white plays um, f3, then bishop here and followed by rook knight d7, removing the defender. Rook a4, white loses the pawn, the rest of the pawns are weak, it, the game is technically winning for black. So, knight c6 would be an impossible tactical trick, white would be forced to play something like knight d3, but after a change of queens, bishop f8 or king f7, black has um, a standard, slightly better Berlin position, uh, his bishops are stronger, he has uh, to exchange only one pair of rooks, because uh, keeping rook with the bishops is recommended. Uh, as this position, if you play only with the minor pieces, uh, it, it would be easy for white to defend, because uh, mostly the exchanges favor the, the defend, def defensive side. So, um, queen e6, interesting, but in the game happened queen b5, which is also not bad, queen takes, and now uh, in the hint side, it is easy to say that taking with the c6 pawn would probably have been better, as black would be able to play c6, and he would be not stuck with those weaknesses, that he would be stuck as in the game. However, um, I think that uh, here, even after d5, right, the computer moved d5, uh, black probably has uh, very little um, advantage, Bishop e3 is not a very strong computer move. Black cannot allow bishop a7, so he has to play a5 of, after knight d5. There are a lot of threats. Black cannot play bishop f8 because of bishop b6. So black has to play something like knight f5 and force the game into either opposite color bishop endgame, which is a draw, or, um, or just uh, play knight c4, which starts the whole tactical chain here. Bishop d4. Uh, again, the position is roughly equal here. So, um, but okay, but I like knight b5. Uh, the cd5 was uh, recommended uh, by other commentators because this match happened such a long time ago. There were a lot of commentators over the years, I would say even over decades, if not centuries, right? Because it's happened like 150 years ago. And uh, a lot of people tried to, you know, make their take on the game. But knight b5. Uh, the, the game move I, I, I find completely reasonable. And uh, this was actually a mistake, and White had to take the spawn and try to transpose the game into this position where he would be slightly worse because um, Black's uh, Knight and Bishop are stronger than White's uh, Rook and two pawns. But this would be very close to equal because, uh, again, I believe that probably white can just play b4 here 
and not worry about uh, losing his uh, bishop, uh, dark squared bishop here. Although the computer disagrees and he says that white should play h3 first, but I think it's semantics. The evaluation is roughly the same. Uh, black still plays h5, h4. White still has some problems um, developing his, uh, pushing his pawns. In fact, he should not push his pawns too far or they become really weak. And black needs to avoid the rook exchange. He needs that rook uh, to, you know, coordinate with his minor pieces. Right, so black has a certain advantage here. However, the game move uh, gave black a chance to get a huge advantage. White plays knight d3, and now black plays a very hasty bishop f5, and move very inaccurate, which uh, deprives him of that advantage that he could have gotten if he played a5 first. Because after a5, white has to play knight c2, but after bishop f5, this bishop attacks both knights, forcing white to play rook d1, and after that black can play either c5 immediately, uh, using the fact that, uh, again, white cannot take with the pawn or knight because of the knight c2 or knight d3 being under attack, or he can play a4 first, threatening to play a3, undermine the whole chain, putting the c3 pawn in danger, and uh, basically establishing black's knight on b5 as a dominant, highly threatening piece, uh, because it takes so many white pawns are under fire. And white plays a3, if he plays this move, for example, then knight d4. And uh, white cannot take this knight because of rook d4, he loses piece back. White uh, Black gets extra pawn in the end. White probably has to play bishop c7 here, and this endgame is, again, uh, very, very, very unpleasant for white to play this, in addition to a pair of bishops advantage for black. White has the double f pawns, and um, Maybe, maybe it's not so easy to uh, black to make, you know, a concrete play for a win here, but the white will be suffering for a very long time. So maybe, again, a4 is interesting, but uh, c5 is also looks very reasonable. Uh, black just wants to grab this extra pawn, and probably white will have to uh, give this pawn, because, um, because of the threat of 92 check, the rook on d3 is uh, under threat. White has no time to take pawn on c7 back. King f8, king f1, I'm sorry, preventing this knight to check allows black the time to play knight e6, attacking the bishop, defending the pawn, and transposing the game into the endgame where black has the extra pawn. So king f7, and the computer value is position is minus 1.2. So anything above 1 is uh, actually a large advantage. Okay, so extra pawn, it's a very healthy pawn, it's a huge advantage for black. So this was the move that uh, black should have played. Instead, he played bishop f5 immediately, and he allowed Steinis to play a4 first, and he plays knight d6. So the computer says that black should have now played a5, instead of playing knight d6, as white now plays a5 and um, manages to create a strong outpost for his knights on b4 and c5 squares, attacking those uh, vulnerable now black pawns on the queen side. So I would say a5 looks very reasonable, that would be a very modern way to uh, for the grandmaster to play, because he realizes he might be uh, no longer playing for a win with black, and he would be looking for ways to uh, minimize risk, any potential risk. So AB5, AB4, knight is in, under attack, so he has to take here and probably just take on B4, take on uh, exchange these pieces and bishop C7 followed by rook E2. The active rook together with the opposite color bishops, potentially black bishop goes to D5, uh, creates it very unlikely that uh, white can um, claim any advantage in this situation. Coupled with the fact that after b3, rook b2, black in fact simply exchanges the rooks. And this is the very clear draw. Uh, black would probably even make a draw even if white's pawn was on c5, but he has a pawn on d4, the pawn on b3 will be falling. So this is a very easy draw for black. Instead, black uh, plays knight d6 and tries to fight uh, for an advantage by inertia, but after a5 becomes reasonably close that uh, white is the one who is playing for an advantage now. So what happened the game was knight b5 and black uh, 
was probably not in time to react to such a quick change in the circumstances. Uh, the computer says that Black should have played Bishop F8 finally. You know, get the bishop away from E7 from those C6 forks. You know, open the rooks, exchange some stuff here. For example, if A6. Now Black can simply play B6 because White cannot take this pawn on C6 as the knight on D3 is under attack, right? And so, in fact, A6 is not such a great move here. Knight C5 probably is a superior move. And, of course, Bishop C8, again, is not such a great idea because of A6. And now the knight goes here and there is a mess. Probably Black must go into this line where he is left with two minor pieces against rook and two pawns but compared to the line that we saw previously right with the white pawns on a4 d4 um, this pawn on c5 looks very nasty um, it uh, takes the d6 square away pushes the knight further back and creates um, fixes um, uh, black pawns uh, and also there is a threat of bishop e3 as well as more fantastic threat of rook a5 and possibly even some point rook b5, rook b7 uh, exchange sack because uh, if black takes on b7 that will create an absolute monster pawn on b7 a, a very advanced uh, past protected pawn so this uh, uh, position is evaluated as 0.7 which is large advantage for white but not too large so it was playable um, in the game knight b5 was played but after a6 Actually, knight b5 is not that bad, right? Knight b5 is not that bad. Bishop f8 was interesting uh, because black realizes he needs to get rid of those knights. He changes this knight and he plays b6. He manages to solve his uh, immediate problems. However, he has a long-term problem now. White pawn on a6 is untouchable, neither by black's bishop, neither by black's knight. His a7 and c7 pawns are potential targets, especially with the white knight coming to b4, c6 which will be an ideal square for white knight and um, the only problem is um, how white can do that the threat is to play c5 uh, thanks to the pin so white reacts with rook e3 and um, king f7 uh, pretty normal move I would say the idea is that if white plays rook e1 and uh, many commentators here pointed out that bishop d6 uh, would be probably the best human move Possible. The computer suggests c5, which is a modern way of playing this position. Uh, Black knowingly um, uh, commits himself to the double c pawns. However, uh, white a6 pawn is now being able to be targeted, right? At the same time, white knight on d3, he has no squares. Uh, he is poorly placed. There is no way for white to reroute his knight to c4 from where he can reach that a5 c6 magic square which gives white time for example he plays bishop g3 black plays bishop d6 he exchanges his bad bishop and uh, black is very close to getting that a6 pawn potentially either by king march we see d7 c6 b6 and the white is unable to get his knight to a5 c6 as i mentioned before so this position is uh, dynamically equal uh, however, the human move, of course, there are other lines involving g5 and uh, bishop d6, as mentioned by the commentators. The idea is that now white cannot actually, you know, take on d6 and play knight b4 because uh, black king gets to d7. He protects everything and then black starts the counteroffensive because his king is closer to the center. Uh, even though uh, probably white should still play bishop e3 here and uh, Due to the fact that uh, bishop on a3 prevents black playing c5, he can later play c4, g4, f3. White's position is still slightly superior. Uh, thanks again in part due to most of the pawns on the black side being on the black color. The color of the bishop, which is not that great. So, um, bishop d6 was normal, however, um, uh, Sukertor played rook d7, uh, which is a real blunder which turns the game completely um, in wise favor and um, you know it's hard to understand why black would willingly put himself under this huge pin on the e-file uh, that is a lot of uh, that is actually a good lesson for the um, more or less um, starting to be advanced players 
uh, as pins are one of the critical things in uh, chess you know trying to pin the opponent's pieces and uh, that is one thing that grandmaster is always in the lookout for they always try to create those uh, pins because that sets up all sorts of nasty tactics and here uh, black allows white to do this maneuver with the knight on b4 because you know unprotected rook e8 uh, does not allow black bishop e7 to take on b4 at the same time the bishop on f4, on f4 takes the key square d6 from black's rook and um, white finally gets to c6 where he will be attacking the a7 pawn and attacking black's e7 bishop in addition so g5, black tries some, some tricks here, and um, knight c6 would be winning almost immediately, but again, we cannot blame St um, Steinis for not seeing this move, as the sequence of bishop f4, rook h2 is not really that easy to see. Um, white sacrificed the bishop, but black has nowhere to go, because if he moves his uh, rook d6, then rook h7 with knight f7 check coming. If the rook goes to d8, then we have simple check, take and rook h7, and white has rook, and three pawns for black's two minor pieces, and this is a very technical win, plus three is just a huge, uh, decisive, uh, far decisive advantage than necessary. The pawns are rolling on the king side, uh, the pawn on a7 potential target uh, as well, and is completely winning position for white. However, Stanis plays a safer move, he plays f4, which uh, still keeps his advantage. Uh, black still has to play c5, knight c6, and after c takes d4, with uh, looking at the tactical melee. Um, knight f5 check is a reasonable move, probably the strongest move. The idea is if rook plays d8, then you have knight c6, and rook has to go back to d7, and just taking on g5, and black is completely pinned everywhere. The pawn on d4 is pinned because of rook d7, the knight on b5 pinned is because of uh, he has to protect pawn on a7, and the bishop on e7 is pinned because of this uh, rook on e1, right? Black is forced to play here king f8, but after rook e5, for example, bishop c5, c4, knight d6, then we also have b4, white is completely winning here. So, um, uh, 95 was the more straightforward win. Stanis decides to take on t4. He is sort of calling black shots here, saying, I'm not scared, I'm just gonna grab all that stuff because you're not going anywhere. So, king f8 uh, has to be played, 95 was the threat. And now, uh, Stanis, Stanis plays rook e5. He, cannot, he didn't find the strongest move here, which is bishop f2. Uh, the idea is that uh, white indirectly protects the pawn on um, d4 uh, because uh, then you just simply grab this and uh, black rook is under fire white is a full piece up with a winning position so um, but if black plays gf5 then simply here and uh, i believe even knight, is, uh, knight a7 is good but uh, strong even is, is b4 you know, waiting for bishop f6 and then knight a7 followed by knight c6 with a winning position. Again, it's not so simple. Um, it looks very pretty. Uh, rook e5, the move played in the game by the world champion, uh, does not uh, sort of uh, diminish the advantage. I mean, it, it diminishes the advantage, but he still leaves some advantage to white. So knight e4, now knight a7 is impossible because of rook a8, right? So he has to take knight. Rook f5 check, king g7. And now we come to the important point in the game. Uh, right now, black pawn on g5 is under fire, right? There are two ways to take it, with the pawn or with the rook. Steinis takes it with the pawn. He decides to open the bishop, but this creates some uh, measure of counterplay for black. In fact, the best way to play this was to take it with the rook. If uh, bishop takes here, then the rook takes bishop f4 and then we have um, rook a8 um, rook b4 rook a7 um, rook c7 actually um, ah and then rook c3 right this is tricky the threat is to play rook a3 and then you have um, um, 
two extra points in the rook end game, they should be winning. So this is a very uh, th this is all a forced computer play, and of course, if white doesn't see this move rook c3, then black simply plays, for example, if you play something like h3, and black just plays b5 here, and this becomes a draw because uh, there is no way to keep a6 pawn alive. Black just pushes forward his b pawn. And it's uh, one versus two on the king side with a draw. So uh, that's actually very reasonable that uh, White didn't see this line, um, which is why he probably didn't take with rook. Because uh, if Black just plays king f7, then check rook e5, king f1, is just extra pawn, right? Three versus one, easily win position of White. Um, but probably you know that rook end game was tricky, and that's the reason why Steinis plays uh, safer move. He takes on g5 and he sets a nice trap uh, because he foresees that black sees this beautiful idea which sets up a, a trap, right? But Steiny saw this way before and he was uh, hoping that black would play this beautiful move, uh, you know, with a trap idea. And uh, this was bishop c5, which was played by Sukirtort, which was the final mistake in the game. Uh, what happened was that uh, white can just take this bishop. You cannot take this rook, obviously, because of mate in one. But uh, after bishop c3, black is stuck in the pawn down endgame, where white king marches to d3, followed by b4, and uh, white eliminates all these pawns, while black king is stuck uh, protecting his um, king side from uh, uh, white's uh, past pawns. And these past pawns, they all protect each other. So... Um, the game continued here and uh, black resigned right so that bishop c5 was the critical point critical mistake instead black should have played rook d7 just uh, like he did before uh, he wants to play bishop c5 so if um, bishop f2 but then rook f8 uh, bishop here and uh, rook after rook f5 rook f7 it's certainly 0.67 uh, even maybe less white's um, has an extra pawn, but it's uh, double, and black has a nice bishop on d6 with some ideas uh, possibly playing rook a5, rook a6 here, going after the a6 pawn. It's not easy for white to push his king side pawns because, again, they are double, therefore they're weak, right? If any g4, then rook f4. If the bishop uh, moves somewhere, then uh, the possibility for black to play bishop g3. White rooks also have to be careful because. Uh, of all those back ranks uh, checks, right? Bishop on d6 taking away that h2 pawn, uh, h2 square away from white. So uh, white will be seriously um, contested here. Uh, black has some reasonable chances to hope to make a draw in this position, and um, it would be probably a fair result. But uh, bishop c5 was the second blunder in the game by black, and uh, the first time he Blundered, he missed that a4 move by white, right? And now this is more fatal blunder, and uh, it results in uh, position, right? Uh, fg5, he plays bishop c5, and after rook c5, uh, just forced end game, pawn end game, pawn down for black, and uh, black loses the game. So after this game, the score is now uh, plus two for Steinitz. Um, he is um, playing great chess, he is outcalculating his opponent, he is uh, also outmaneuvering him in the positional game, so we can see him as a more dominant player in this part of the match. Um, there are a few less games to play, a few games left to play, uh, but looking uh, in the hindsight, we can say that uh, these perhaps were critical games, as they left uh, definitely a psychological mark on uh, uh, Sukirtort, as uh, he won only one game out of the last uh, five or six games, while Steinitz won um, last uh, four games or something, right? But that we're going to take a look at the next uh, video. Uh, so thank you for staying. Hope you enjoyed this video, and uh, um, I hope to see you again.